All right, we are live on Facebook and we are recording. This is our new video podcast, The Evidence-Based Triathlete. And tonight we're going to talk about the evidence and anecdotes about warm-up. Hey, Ted, how's it going? Good. How are you doing today? Oh, it's Friday the 13th in 2020. Friday the 13th of 2020. Watch out. Oh. It's scary out there, boys and girls. Speaking of scary, what are you growing there? I know, right? This is my Movember. Oh, oh, there you go. <laughs> um, so I actually, uh, I've had a mustache uh, one day of my entire life. Yeah. So when my wife and I, when we started dating, I had a goatee. And oh. uh, I was like, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm done with this. It'd been a, like a year, maybe. And uh, I was like, well, you know, what? I have never had a mustache. So I just shaved the bottom of the goatee <laughs> off. And uh, we were looking at some pictures recently. And I saw that. I'm like, you know what? It's November. I'll grow a mustache for for uh, for for November. Maybe even through maybe even through December. Who knows? I I don't know how the mask is going to go with that, right? Yeah, that's right. When I'm when I'm running and it's cold and I get the the snot going through the through yeah. the mustache, I might change my mind. Yeah, no, masks are less effective with beards and mustaches. So yeah, ex exactly. But I figure with the mustache, it might be okay, right? Yeah. Maybe less with the beard because you don't get the seal. Mm -hmm. But uh, right. yeah, so that's 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 going on. Okay, but now I want to ask you, when you looked at that picture yeah. of yourself with a goatee, how much did you weigh back then? More. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, you know, in my late 20, or is it, that was, I was 24, 23, 24, yeah. Yeah. I probably weighed like 170. Okay, yeah. And what are you now? Like 145, 143. Yeah. And that was pre-triathlon days. That was pre-triathlon days. That was uh, beer drinking yeah. Uh, beer drinking chicken wing eating days oh man um, john actually you know we've never talked about it before and i don't know if you know but um up until i was so from when i was 14 to when i was 20 i did orienteering hmm and i don't know if we ever really talked about that is that no we didn't and did you was that were you living in canada at the time yeah i was living in canada yeah. and i belonged to you know, orienteering clubs and I actually started my own orienteering club when I was 19. Oh, cool. Um, and uh, actually competed in national championships. Wow. Uh, in, in orienteering. I was on Team Alberta. Uh, yeah, so I think I competed in five or six national championships and actually was on a team, a relay team that won the national championship one year. I did not know that. Yeah, so I, I, I used to be pretty fit for, you know, because orienteering is, I mean, if, you, if people don't know what it is, it's running through the forest with a compass and a map from point to point. And, and an analog compass, not a digital an analog North compass. Yes. So. yes. And that's all you could have is an analog compass. Um, and, you know, the distances were around 10K, uh, mm -hmm. what, what we cover, but it's 10K. It's a hard 10K because like you're going cross country and not always on paths. Mm -hmm. Right. And uh, in the mountains, uh, in the foothills of Alberta, it was, it was quite challenging. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so that's what I did for like I think, in, uh, I think it was 14 when I started grade eight, you know, grade eight, grade nine. And then I did it till I was 20. And wow. uh, when I, when I got into the middle of college, it wasn't so cool to be an orienteer anymore. Oh. Um, I, I honestly, I do miss it. It was, those were some good times. No, that, that uh, was always very attractive to me. I remember, remember seeing it, but you know, I was in New York and had no opportunity to do orienteering or I never found so out how to do it. New York is actually an area that has a lot of orienteering. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's what I was saying is that, or I just never found out how to get involved with it. Yeah. But I have to say to be a national champion in orienteering in Canada, yeah. that's impressive. Yeah. I still got my medals. I should, I should, <laughs> down. I should put them on the wall. They're not there actually on that wall. All right. Um, so let, let but, me ask you this. Yeah. Before an orienteering event, did you warm up? Absolutely. Well, not when I, not when I started, cause I didn't know any better, yeah. but when I started going to like national, national team camps, um, then we had coaches and we absolutely warmed up mm. and, you know, and I can tell you there were some really cold races in oh, Canada, I bet. I bet. you know, I can remember running in like snow and, yeah. you know, always seemed like it was always raining or something. So it was even more important, uh, to warm up. Um, and then most of the time we all, we all, we also slept in tents between uh -huh. races. So, so what are you saying? So some of them must have been longer than 10K or were there multiple series of them? The, the, well, the distance for, for youth were a little shorter. Okay. So like when I was 13, 14, I think the distance was like about a 5K. Yeah. And then it went up like a couple K every, every it was two year okay. age groups. So it went mm -hmm. up a, a couple K. And then when I was 20, 
I think the longest races were maybe like 15 K, mm. but when they do it, they measure that point to point. Okay. Right. So, oh, if it's yeah. a, so you don't, you could be, you could be yeah. like, usually it's like one point, yeah, usually it was like 1.5 times what the actual point to point uh, was. So yeah, we, one day we'll have an orienteering talk. Well, maybe, maybe the Barkley marathon is on your radar then, huh? There, th th it actually might be. Actually, what I'd really like to do, honestly, I'd like to do an orienteering race again because it's been like 28 years. Yeah. And uh, so every time I go back to Canada, I always look and it never yeah. seems to work out. But they oh, have a series where I grew up in Calgary and it's Wednesday nights and it was always Wednesday nights and they still have it. And I just, I haven't been able to, to bring myself to do one. But next time I go there in the summer and it's a Wednesday night, I'm going to do another orienteering race. Oh, nice. Well, I, I would say orienteering here in the desert is a little boring because that's one of the things I love about, you know, some of the distance things we do. And I, especially long distance bike, you, you look out over the horizon and say, oh, I want to go there. And there yeah. could be 50 miles away. <laughs> so. Exactly. Yeah. So when, uh, you know, when you rode from the lake and when we did the lake to Mount Charleston yeah. and you get up and you finally could see Mount Charleston, like, oh, I'm just going there. Yeah. Right. You're right. there in like seven hours. <laughs> that's where we're going. <laughs> Yeah. So, so yeah. So warm up. Let's, let's talk about warm up tonight. Yeah. I think that, that would be great because I think that everyone, I think, I think that everyone would agree that warm up is important, mm -hmm. but I contend that most triathletes don't warm up before they train. What do you mm -hmm. think? Well, maybe we have to define what a warm up is i think a purposeful warm up i would purposeful agree warm. with you where they say i am doing a warm up unless they're in the pool for some reason it's very um, common to include a warm up in your swim but not on your bike or your run you always have a warm up set right yeah but the thing is is that you warm up by swimming yeah right 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 so that's, that's the other thing. Like, I think some people, they warm up running, but say, okay, you know, I'll do the first mile a little easier mm -hmm. and then I'll, then I'll start running harder. Right. And, and the same with the bike, right? Do, I don't know too many people that do like a bicycle warm up mm -hmm. before, they, before they do it. Oh. But if we look at elite athletes, they absolutely do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, you know, you go to any collegiate cross country team before they, before they run, there is a dedicated warm-up time, and it's yep. uh, and it does not consist of just running slow and then running fast. Mm -hmm. There's actually a uh, there's a method to the madness, mm -hmm. and you know I think even in the swim, like, and I I think I've said that on the podcast before. You know I swim with a group of 12, 14 people, and I am the only person that does a warm-up out of the pool. I have my bands, mm -hmm. spend ten minutes. I have a routine. I do it every single time mm -hmm. and you think that eventually it would wear off but i know why it's not and that's because i'm still in lane one. Oh, right, right. right if i was in lane four or five yeah maybe, maybe oh man this guy knows what he's doing yeah. but no this guy's in lane one he's a slow swimmer so he mustn't know what he's doing um so but you know it's interesting because like i don't know about you but before i run I always, if I have, if I have the time and I always try to make the time, I always do a warm up. Mm -hmm. I, I have uh, my TRX bands and I do right. a, TR, a little bit of TRX. I have, I have some uh, boxes. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I do skipping. I do, I have a, I have a, a variety of exercises that I do before I go out and run. And there's a lot of evidence to support that we should be warming up before we exercise. No, that's so, great. And um, on the opposite end, yeah. I do warm up in a run, but I just start off slow. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, I build it from there, sometimes purposefully, and, and sometimes it just happens. And so uh, I think it just, I think a lot of times for people, it happens, right? Yeah, right. Because it's like you're stiff mm -hmm. and you don't have the range of motion yet. Yeah. And you're cold, especially in the morning, the, that first run of the day. Yeah, uh, but I'll, I'll tell you, sometimes I, I actually like doing my run first thing in the morning because I am trying to, to combat that stiffness yep. and trying to get things moving. Now, when I was young, I, when I would do, uh, when I would compete in 5Ks and 10Ks, I did uh, just find out, you know, by experimenting, I'm not experimenting, but doing, trying different things, 
uh, that I needed about a 20 minute slow warm up right before the start. And then I would have uh, my best opportunity to have a good run. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, and I, and I think if we were to look at high level athletes and in particular in shorter distance events, and I'm saying uh, Olympic distance racing and below for triathlon. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and even some athletes with a, with a half Ironman, they warm up. Mm -hmm. they, it, there's a purpose to it. And there's a method to the madness. And it actually, there's lots of evidence to support proper warm up will increase performance. And we're going we're gonna to talk about that maybe in another episode. But today I wanted like really just to talk about um, warming up for practice and for, for, for training. Mm -hmm. And how it can be, you know, how it can be beneficial and kind of the physiologic things that can, that, that, that will happen as we warm up. So I think the first thing that we should talk about is number one is we're going to, you know, and this is the obvious thing is that we're going to increase blood flow, right? So, I mean, John, you're a physiologist, pseudo, pseudo physiologist. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, what, wh why would we want to increase blood flow to, to, to muscles that we're about to work? Well, uh, actually, I'd say we're all physiologists. We're all interested in how the body moves exactly. and works. Some of us just start <laughs> trying to understand performance from different perspectives. I probably start with an equation first, and so that's why I'm a biomechanist. So right. others may start with energy systems or what have you. So, so yeah. So you know, blood flow, increased blood flow. The whole idea of aerobic exercise is you need oxygen. And the increased temperature of a muscle will help with disassociation of oxygen in the blood. So it helps with getting oxygen. We're talking about the Bohr effect, right? What's that? Talking about the Bohr effect? Oh, yeah. Okay, nice. <laughs> we're, getting we're getting really technical tonight. So, so you, you actually add to the next step, right? So the increased blood flow does things, right? So it increases muscle temperature, which is important. It'll also increase core temperature especially when you get out of bed in the morning, um, you know, research is pretty good on this. Our, for the most part, our core temperature is the lowest right when we wake up, mm -hmm. or actually it's about four o'clock in the morning. So depending on when you wake up, um, but definitely when we wake up, our core temperature is uh, a little bit low. So I think we'd all agree that increasing muscle temperature would be a good thing before we kind of, you know, kind of get, get it going and core temperature would also get it going. Um, so, one of the, you know, my students actually asked me this. This is kind of why I came up with this this week. They basically said, Mr. Gerard, why do athletes, like, what, why do they warm up? This is my, the, the young love that. Yeah, Great question. I love that. Like, why do they spend this time? Right? Because time is precious. Think about the NCAA. You get 20 hours a week to train. Mm -hmm. And we're going to take 20 minutes every time to, to, to dedicate to warming up. It must be important. So, you know, we started, to, we started talking about this. So the one, the analogy I always go to is the rubber band analogy. And I think we talked a little bit about this before about the rubber band in the freezer or the rubber band in the warm glass, warm cup of water, mm -hmm. right? And when we look at our muscles and our muscles basically are, I mean, they're kind of like rubber bands. And uh, if we take that rubber band out of a freezer and I try and pull on it, my, it, it definitely won't, displace as much and it might break if i take that rubber band out of the warm out of warm water and i pull it it's going to go further and it's probably not going to break mm -hmm. and so if i can slowly warm up my my muscles i you know not only do i think i believe that that is going to have a positive effect on performance and also potentially uh decrease injury rate and there is good evidence to support that warmups can reduce injury and increase performance. Would you, would you agree that that's what the literature says? Yes, I think that it is. Uh, it's not easy research to do, No, but it is uh, generally accepted in both science and in uh, anecdotes that, that the warmups are important to minimize the risk of injury. Now it does, and I know you're gonna go in this direction, it does depend on what the warmup is. Absolutely. Because the change we, we have changed the way that we think about a warm up and what exercises are appropriate in a warm up. Yeah, no, for sure. So, you know, if we look back even 20 years ago, the warm up, the common warm up in almost all athletics was a couple, couple laps around the field, right? Or around the track. 
and then let's sit around in a circle and stretch. Yep. And that has absolutely changed. And I think everyone, I think most people understand now that the dynamic warm up is uh, probably the most uh, efficacious. Mm -hmm. um, now, if we want to get purely into performance, though, this is a little bit different. Uh, there are some aspects of it that might be a little bit different, but for, for just getting out and going for a jog or getting out and going for a bike ride where you're not trying to, to win, let's say, right. You're not trying to get that KOM on the Strava segment outside of your house. Um, I think that the dynamic warm up is, is the best way as far as what we know right now. Now, 15 years from now, the evidence might be different. Mm -hmm. right? And that's the exciting thing about, you know, about evidence in this area is it's constantly, uh, it's constantly changing. Well, and there is some um, new, there's a movement to have some new gear that helps you warm up yep. by uh, heating your shirt or heating your pants. And actually, uh, I had the pleasure of going over to my first plane with Spain, which was a pleasure and doing some uh, work with Hoob Design where they were looking at the influence of a, um, a shirt, uh, a sweatshirt that would heat up yep. and then uh, seeing the effect of that on uh, swim performance. So that, that was pretty neat. And they're coming to market with some things. So then let's put it another way. If we look at pro cyclists, what do they do? They do a dynamic warm up, then they get on their bikes, then they put an ice vest on. Mm -hmm. Right? So yeah. one of the things we want to do is we want to increase core temperature, but not too much. Mm -hmm. So that's that, is, but that, but they have, you know, in pro cycling in particular, if they're getting ready for a time trial, mm -hmm. they could go like, for like a, a 10 mile time trial. They might warm up for 90 minutes or two hours. Yeah. So it's a, I mean, that's a little bit different, uh, different world, but yes, uh, I, I, I think that the, the warming up ex from external sources is, is a good, uh, potentially a good thing, depending on, uh, the environment we're going to be racing in. So in the water, probably would be a good thing if the water's cooler, right? Uh, if you're going to go race a sprint triathlon, let's say the Las Vegas triathlon in September. No. Yeah, you probably don't want to be sitting in your sauna before you uh, no. before you go out there. So let's talk about let's talk about before we go into you know maybe like the how to do it. Let's keep let's continue on like maybe some of the evidence as far as like what can happen. So. Um, and this is this is all evidence based thing. So I'll, I'll run down a few. So one of them is, is to we can actually improve uh, the rate of uh, force development. Mm -hmm. So force development and 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 basically I look at this as like how much you know in every step you're you're stepping when you're running how much force you're able to actually produce every step. So just by doing a little bit or doing a warm up we can actually increase that. Um, there's the there's some timing issues in, in warm up as well. So when we run, in particular when we run, we're constantly changing between um, uh, agonist and antagonist muscles, or concentric to eccentric, um, muscles lengthening versus muscle shortening. And this there's a coordination between them. And when the coordination goes good, we've talked about this before. Running economy increases, right? Mm -hmm. So there's evidence to support that. Warming up will increase running economy via the proper contraction and relaxation of uh, 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 of the of the musculature. So there's a couple of really, you know, maybe more nuanced things um, that 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 are that are that are that are out there. I mean, John, is that something that you've been coming across? Seeing that yeah, stuff? Uh, and you know, to build on that a bit, uh, the warm up will. Well, let, let's go back. What you know, muscle performance. If we're talking about muscle performance, we're talking about the ability of the muscle to generate force. And how do you generate force? Well, there's lots of different things that actually influence that force, but one of them is how long the muscle is. Yep. And uh, actually years ago, uh, we had a faculty member here at UNLV, Dr. Harvey Wallman, physical therapist, and he had uh, an idea, well, if you do static stretching versus dynamic stretching, and I know this goes more towards performance, but I think this is, this is um, I think the performance is linked to being able to have a good workout. So, uh, but if you, and his idea was, if you had, if you did static stretching, you would make the muscle long. If you yep. did dynamic stretching, you would improve the contractility of the muscle. 
as opposed to making it long. And then, uh, so he did an experiment, we did an experiment where we had people stretch statically and then also do a dynamic warm up, and then did a vertical jump. And I'm like, this isn't gonna have any impact. Everyone jumped about a centimeter lower following static uh, stre uh, stretching. And so why is, stre why is the length of the muscle influence muscle performance? Well, the, the way I explained it in class all the time is I say, well, grab your finger and squeeze your fingers like this. And everyone does it in class and they go, okay, that's great. Yeah. And then I go, now go through some wrist extension. So take your wrist and go with you know, your wrist back and then try to squeeze again. And you can't squeeze as hard. It's the same muscles. It's the same action, but you're not able to generate as much force. So why is that? Well, that's because the muscles causing finger flexion are longer. And so there is a relationship with how long the muscle is and how much force it will generate. And same thing if we try to go through wrist flexion and try to squeeze really hard, can't do that. Yeah, this is a big length, ten, length tension relationship. That's right, length tension relationship. Now, the length tension relationship is technically uh, tested in uh, the test tube. So uh, in vitro, we call it. Um, and there you take the muscle out, you let it flop around and you figure out what its resting length is. And then you, either, you then you test how much tension it can generate based upon that length, and then you stretch it, and then you stimulate it to contract again, and you go through that. The problem with uh, testing in vivo or in the person is I don't know what my rest true resting length of a muscle is. I get well, I have to start somewhere and say, okay, this is my beginning length, and then I need to go shorter or longer, and then figure out how much force I'm generating. This is a, a really big problem, and this is why. A lot of the warm up is, is geared towards muscles that cross two joints. Yep. Especially the hamstring. So the hamstring wants to move the hip in one direction, call it hip extension, and it wants to flex the knee. So it wants to bend the knee, and both of those shorten the muscle. Well, if you do one, now you have a harder time to uh, generate force and do the other. And so this is one of the problems with the hamstrings. And, why but John, I think I would I contend that you're right with the two joint muscles, but let's look at the, the gastrocnemius, right? So part of the calf, two yep. joint muscle, the rectus femoris, two joint muscle. Yep. Uh, and if you, so if you name rectus femoris, uh, hamstring and, and, and gastrocnemius, I'm going to throw this out there that if, to the triathlon community, how many of you have injured one of those? Yeah. Now let's make sure gastroc is the calf muscle. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. No, that's right. <laughs> yep, the calf muscle and the quad and the rectus femoris is one of the quadricep muscles. One of the quadriceps on the front of your thigh. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you're right. The two joint muscles are are are, are critical because they're being asked basically to do two different things at, uh, potentially at once. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah, I I think that that's that's important. And we have them in the shoulder as well, right? Yep. The long head of the tricep. Yep. Two joint muscle. The biceps. Two joint muscle. Um. So, I mean, I I think that. Uh, th those are all reasons. And then there's more, right? So uh, the one area that I love to talk about is actually the viscosity hmm. of, of muscles. So I was really fortunate. I, I wonder if I can maybe when we get show notes, I'm going to get uh, some pictures of these in the show notes to see um, uh, the fascia under like electron microscope. Hmm. And um, just to, to see what it actually looks like. And I was explaining this to somebody actually earlier today. And when we have any individual muscle fiber, um, and, and I'm using fiber, in, 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 not in the, the very technical term of muscle fiber, but muscle unit basically has a little fascia around it. And then, the, then we have groups of those, and then we have a fascia around that, and then groups of those and fascia around that. And then we have a fascia grouping all of the muscles together. And if you think about what a fascia or a fascial layer is, um, if you think about it like wood that's been laminated together. So you're doing some work on a, on a trailer. I'm sure there's some laminate. Just uh, a little bit. There's just a little bit of laminate. <laughs> I got to rip a lot of it out. <laughs> exactly. So this is why I wanted to talk to you about laminate. So John's going through a lot of laminate these days. And when we think about laminate, it's just layer after layer of thin material that's been glued together with, a, with an epoxy or a resin or a glue, right? When you look at a fascia on these on the microscopic versions of it, it looks like laminate. Hmm. And it looks like laminate that you're trying to pull apart. 
right? So we, we actually have these layers, layer upon layer upon layer of fascia mm -hmm. that's covering the muscle. And, the, and that can become sticky, right? And that sticky is fascial adhesion. So you probably have, people have heard of these things. Mm -hmm. And by warming up, we can actually change the viscosity. We actually can lower the viscosity, make it less sticky in between those, those, those pieces of laminate. And when those pieces of laminate move a little bit more freely, we will be given the, basically more freedom of movement. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned getting up, going for a run and slowly getting into it. Well, one of the reasons you slowly get into it is because I believe those fascial layers are kind of stuck together. And as we warm up, it changes the viscosity because it, warm, it actually warm, changes the temperature and, and actually kind of loosens up that glue. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, one of the things we do know, and we look at the fascia of a 20-year-old compared to the fascia of a 60-year-old, is the fascia of a 60-year-old is a lot more viscous. It's a lot stickier. Mm -hmm. right? So we, as we, I contend, as we age, we should be doing more stuff to keep warm and more fascial work to keep the, 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 the laminate from being stuck so hard together. No, have, you heard, have you heard this principle? Yes, I love it. And and for viscosity, another way to, to think of that is how thick the fluid is. Yeah. So if you take your your syrup out of the fridge, it just sort of pours out really slowly. But if you warm that up, it will pour smoother. So yeah. more viscous means thicker, uh, thicker fluid. Yeah. So yeah, no. And in fact, what's really interesting is uh, one of, the, one of the ideas in locomotion is that the muscle isn't really contracting and shortening. All it's, do is, all it's doing is contracting enough to put enough tension on that connective tissue. So then that connective tissue acts like that rubber band you spoke of, yep. that it, there's that elastic behavior of that uh, elastic material, the connective tissue. And, and so, yeah, as we get older, how well our connective tissues, tendons, ligaments, fascia, how well they uh, spring back, it gets a little bit worse. And, and yeah. so that, that just, is yeah. a function of aging and, uh, and a decline in performance. Yeah. So uh, I don't have the reference and I wish I did because I didn't know we were gonna talk about this. Um, have you ever heard uh, or seen the paper? It was talking about the hip flexors in particular and the hip flexors during running and how basically there's very little muscle activity and it's all elastic basically. So yeah, and, and, and it's mostly generating force to swing your leg forward. <laughs> and it, exactly, but it's, the, but it's the elastic component of it. It's not the muscular component. That's right, you're, that's right. You're loading it with the hip extensors yeah. and it's the elastic coming forward that is, that is, the, um, that is the, the, the important part of, of locomotion and, and running. And, and, you know, and oftentimes we'll, oh, you know, I've injured my hip flexor. Okay, we got to do lots of strength of your hip flexor. Right. It's not that, it's not as a lack of strength. It's, mm -hmm. it's more of you've, you've damaged the elastic component. That's a, that's a great example. Yeah. yeah. And, and you're spot on. I mean, that's what happens. The leg at the end of stance, you're, yeah. you're about to toe off where you've now gone through all that hip extension now you've got to swing that hip forward and a lot of that is elastic behavior. And interestingly, one of the limits to performance is how well you're able to get that leg back out in front of you so you can do the next step. Yep. And, and, and do it with the least amount of energy possible, right? That's right, that's right. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I actually, yeah, I, I think that's actually one of the reasons that most, a lot of people struggle running hills. Yeah, uphill right? or Just downhill? Down, or sorry, uphill. Yeah. It's, it's they haven't developed enough elastic component to bring that leg forward. And so then they end up working the hip flexors mm -hmm, mm -hmm. when they're not really meant to do that. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah. But, and we can, and, and, and during warm up is the time to, in my opinion, to do that and to, to get that elastic component, um, you know, more pliable and yeah. And, and just basically warm, warmer. And, and to your point, the elastic behavior does not cost anything. So it's it doesn't cost calories. Freebies. It doesn't, yeah. it doesn't you, you don't have to convert carbohydrates to uh, generate ATP. You, don't, you, you, you just stretch it and it recoils. Yeah. That's great. Exactly, yeah. So, I mean, we've covered, we've covered a lot of pieces here. 
So one of the things I wanted to talk about was some practical application. Okay. So this is something my students always ask me to like, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. You've talked about the theory long enough. What do we, what do we need to do? What can we do? So let's start out with the swim. So you mentioned that most swimmers warm up and I agree, right? They warm up in the water by swimming. I contend that we should be warming up out of the water mm -hmm. by, and I think band work and body work. So, and I think, you know, I, I think most people that as they age start to get shoulder issues. Most, you know, you can always tell the swimmers, right? Cause they all got shoulder issues. Mm -hmm. And one of the areas that, you know, I, I contend that people have shoulder issues because is because of lack of scapular. So your shoulder blade control. And, you know, we can look at rotator cuff issues. We can look at biceps issues, but they're, they're all tend to be issues of lack of rotator cuff or lack of scapular control. So I, I actually do like scapular, scap, basically a scapular warm up and a, and a rotator cuff warm up. Um, basically, so, it, it, and we're going to talk about potentiation down the road, but basically to wake those muscles up and get the blood flow going to them get them uh, so the, the, the neural signals are happening right, increase that force development, basically get them, get them ready uh, to go. Like I said, it's a 10 minute uh, band routine that I do. Um, maybe what I'll do is I'll do a video of it next time. No, and that'd be great. We can, we can, we can post it on our, uh, on our YouTube channel. Yeah, um, yeah. No, but I, I, think, I think that uh, it, it, it's, it's, once again, it's so easy. And I actually, I think it helps you swimming because I think once you get a more stable scapula, it's more stable base for your arm. For those of you that, that don't know the anatomy that well, your, 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 uh, your upper arm, your humerus connects to your body via your shoulder blade. Mm -hmm. And that's how it attaches. And if you're, so if your shoulder blade itself is not under good control, your humerus will never be under good control or your upper arm will never be under good control. So, and I know that there's a variety of different things that, that we, can, we can do and a variety of different um, band exercises that people do do. Um, and if, if you, once again, you look at elite swimmers, they're doing band exercises. Mm -hmm. I mean, they just, they, they just are. It's, and so I like to emulate uh, the elite if mm -hmm. I can, as much as I can. Yeah, so. oh, that's great. And now on the contrary, I, I don't necessarily warm up for swimming anymore, but I'm also uh, have sort of zeroed in on the minimum swimming I need to do right now. But I enjoy swimming, but I still uh, try to uh, keep it, you know, so that I'm, I'm shooting for consistent exercise, especially now in the off season. Uh, and, I'm and, gonna challenge you to do yeah. a band warm up for, uh, I'm gonna say for a month before you swim and yeah. just see, see how you, maybe you'll enjoy swimming even more. There you go. <laughs> well, and, and I know where you're, I know what you're going to say to what I'm going to say next, but uh, part of the reason why I, what I do is I get to the pool and I jump in and swim. And what I'm doing in my mind is simulating what a race is like, because you don't always have an opportunity to, to warm up, but now you're going to tell me. <laughs> I bring my bands to the, to the race. <laughs> I'm that guy in, you know, in the transition zone doing my band work. That's right. So, you know, um, so there you go. <laughs> that simu right. simulates a race for me. No, but you're, you're, you're right. Like that's, and, and here's the thing. We actually didn't even touch on it, but there is a psychological component to warm up as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So like for me now, like if I don't, if I don't uh, do my band work before I go in the pool, oh man, like I don't feel right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so on Saturdays, my typical thing, especially in the summer, is I run to the pool yeah. and, then I, and then I swim. And on those days, I'm a little time crunch usually because, you know, it's, it's just a little bit tight for me for when we get kicked out of the pool. Um, but I also usually ran 10 miles. So I feel pretty warm. Yeah, like, that's good. You know, my whole body is warmed up first. But other than that, I am, I'm religious with it. Well, um, and, and I am biking to the pool. Uh, yeah, frequently now. So yeah, so you're getting your core temperature up. Yeah, but, but I, I still wanna, I still want to challenge you. Okay, that's challenge. I'm throwing down the gauntlet. No, that's a good challenge. That's a good challenge. And 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 I, but I also have to say that I started doing this uh, in part because you know I did swim uh, for a long period of time, and what swimmers you know tend to do is you start 
you know, figuring out excuses to not get in the water. And you start, you'd you talk on deck, you, you know, you sort of shoot the breeze a little bit. And, you know, you, before you know it, 20, 30 minutes have gone by and you're standing there. And so. Yeah, said, but nobody wants to talk to the weird guy with the bands. That's right. That's true. All right. <laughs> you know, no one's, no one's chatting me up when I'm like, got these bands and I'm doing all this crazy stuff. They're like, who's the weird guy at the end of the pool? No one's talking to me. I love okay. It. Let's make it, uh, especially now I got my mask on and we're swimming. Yeah. Outside, so I got a, I got a, I got my knitted toque hat on. Oh. And um, yeah, it's no one's talking to me. I can promise That's you that. Great. <laughs> oh, but okay. that, but partly I did that to, to get out of that mindset yeah. of delaying and getting in and working out because I yeah. think it is, uh, you, you it, do it, have it, the right it, mindset. It, it is mindset. Right. And so for me, like the mindset is, is, I'm warming up. I have a reason yep. to do this. This is part of the work, the workout. And so like my swim team that I, the, the master swim team, I, I, I swim with, there's a 20 minute warm up time. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the coach starts coaching at 7:20, for example. Mm -hmm. So I start my out of the pool warm up at seven when everyone else jumps in the water and I do 10 minutes and then I get in the water at, I have 10 minutes of swim warm up and then we go. Mm -hmm. So I, I, you know, I, I still am doing the same. I, and I look at it, it's the same amount of work, right? They're not outworking me. I just, I'm doing something that's, that I think is better for me. Yeah. Um, Cause like the traditional swim warm up, at least the ones that I've had with coaches is okay. Uh, swim 250, pull 250, kick 250, uh, 250 of drills. Yep. All right. And, and there, you know, there, and there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with that. I just don't think you're isolating maybe the things that you could that could potentially help you as well. So let me ask you, okay, so that's swim. I know we talked a little bit about the run, but I want to get back to that, but let's talk about the bike. The bike. Yeah. yeah. How do you approach warming up on the bike? Yeah. Okay. So I have a, a TRX that I use and uh, boxes. I do uh, single leg uh, uh, RDL, single leg squats. Um, I try and always get my uh, gluteus medius warmed up. So like the outside of my hip, my hip abductors, um, really trying to get the glutes to fire. So we did the whole talk on glute activation. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'll do something like donkey kicks um, because I, I believe that the glutes are kind of can get almost turned off sometimes when we cycle. And so on this one, it's five to 10 minutes, mm -hmm. just, in, just enough, um, nothing heavy, heavy, I've got a hex bar behind me. It's got like nothing on it. Like it's like a hundred pounds. Mm -hmm. Get into one set of 10 squats. Um, yeah, just really, really basic five, 10 minutes. And then, uh, and then I go. And then if I'm going to do something hard on the bike, like let's say today is my, my, my interval day. Mm -hmm. Then I'll do a, an, an actual warm up on the bike too. Okay. Or, you know, like I'll do like, couple minutes easy 30 seconds hard couple minutes easy 30 seconds hard and like build into it on the bike as well um and then there from time to time i'll even get off the bike and do some more maybe like some lunges or you know and sometimes it's based on how i'm feeling if i feel like once you learn and you're cycling a lot that your glutes aren't quite firing right and they're not quite you know they're maybe you don't feel as supple on the pedals as you normally do I, I don't believe in fighting it. I believe on getting off of the bike and actually doing some movement. That's good. So, but, you know, and I have, you know, and I used to just fight it because eventually you feel good. It may take an hour. Um, but I, I, I've, uh, you know, I've learned that if I get off the bike and, and actually do some stuff that, that, it, that, it, that does help. Mm -hmm. Once again, I'm the weird guy at the park now. Yeah. He's got his bike and his bike gear on and I got, three hours worth of food in my Jersey and I'm doing lunges, right? No, that's great. And that takes discipline. And, you know, I, I, so again, on, on a little different approach, I, I tend to just do consistent rides and uh, I'll start off slow. And I, you know, the route out of my house, is actually a perfect route because it's a little bit of a downhill. And so I'm able just to do some nice light pedaling. And then I have another big downhill where I always, you know, sort of test out my aero position or I, I, I sit up and, you know, I can watch and see what happens when I glossy and all that. And then by the time I get to the trailhead for where I do my rides here, that's, you know, three, four miles at that point, 15 minutes or so. 
and then I'm ready to go. And so that's where my, my warm up is probably less structured, but, uh, but still that you know, ease into it type of, uh, of approach. Yeah. So for me, you know where I live and where I, where I normally ride is in Red Rock. I got three or four miles of uphill. Yeah, right. To start, and it's harder. It's harder to take it easy on the on, on the uphill. Um, but in, in, in John, it, it would change for me too, right? So let's say I'm doing, like on Sunday, I'm going to do a four hour ride. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do a four hour zone high zone one aerobic ride. Nope. I don't warm up for that, right? Right, because I'm going 180 watts for four hours, right? But if I'm going to do anything with some intensity, like a tempo ride or, you know, some sub sub threshold stuff, that's when I warm up. And definitely. And, on the trainer. Yeah. And then and on the trainer, you know, we, I think we talked about it. I'm in this Rift Racing League. Mm -hmm. Oh, my gosh. If I'm not if I don't have a good 45 minute warm up, because mm -hmm. the races, if you've raced on Zwift, it goes from zero to 400 watts in 10 seconds. Mm. And. You know, we're going to talk about warming up for, for performance and it's a little bit different. Um, but I mean, I would be dusted if, mm -hmm. if, you know, we did a race this week that it was like that it was zero to 400 Watts. And for the first like two minutes, and then we hit a climb that, I mean, I consider myself a pretty good cyclist on the top of the climb. I was in 45th position and I did 330 Watts for four, for four minutes. Wow. And I don't weigh that much. Right. Oh, right. So, but imagine if I wasn't warmed up, that mm -hmm. was, that was with a, that, and actually I was a little late getting home from work. So it was, it wasn't quite the warm up I'd wanted, mm -mm. but it's like, you know, when you're doing stuff like that and racing in particular, it's, you gotta, you gotta warm up, but we'll talk more about that. Yeah. So let's talk about the run. Okay. So you mentioned that you, you know, you don't do a whole lot of, a lot of warm up to run. We've talked about this when we talked about the glute activation. Stuff. Yeah, I love that. And actually, I did uh, start incorporating some of those exercises halfway through my run and then at and the end of my run. So and how do you feel like after you do that? Like, let's say 500 meters after you did those. It's amazing how uh, you can identify some of your weak areas. Yeah. Uh, especially if, you're, if you do it mid-run like that. Uh, yeah. And, and I, I was actually quite surprised at how unstable I was in some of those movements. And, and Especially if you're halfway through your run and you, and yeah, and you're like, you, you can't stand on one leg, you can't balance. And it's like, uh -huh. how can I run when I can't balance on one leg and do like a, you know, a toe touch. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, you know, I, same thing as, as the, as the, actually not even same thing for me, if I'm going to run, I have to warm up. Mm -hmm. Like, I just don't feel good if I don't, it takes me, it takes me 15 minutes of, if I don't warm up, it takes me 15 minutes to start to feel good. Yeah. If, if I do, and, and once again, it is a 10 minute routine of lunges, uh, mm. just all those hip activation stuff, calf raises. Sometimes I break out the, the jump rope. I, I mix it up a lot. I have mm -hmm. actually, I'm just going to, I'll share a book that I, yeah. that's my favorite book on this. So I, I, maybe one day we'll get Jay on, but um, this is book. Maybe you've heard of this one. Runner Rewired. Running Rewired. And um, it's all about like stability, gaining stability and warming up and doing strength training, speed work. And, you know, I, I it's actually, I'm going to give this guy a lot of credit. It's all, in, it's all color. Mm. And I just like, honestly i just bust out this book and i'm like okay let's do these five exercises yeah, and, just, right. and they're my warm-up and okay and then so i literally I just keep it right where I, in my warm-up area and i just open it up okay oh, that looks like good 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 do the five four or five things and i'm out the door that's awesome and there's probably i don't know like a hundred different exercises in mm -hmm. that book and i've got you know i've got all my weights and stuff in this room and i just just do it and uh the other really important thing is, is if I'm going to do any kind of quality run, go, I go two, three miles, nice and easy. Then I do a, another five minutes of exercise. Like we talked about the, the glute activation um, and then run like me another like mile and then hit the quality, like do the tempo runs and the intervals. And, um, you know, when, when I, when I do that, oh man, the intervals just feel so good. 
Yeah. You know, you just feel loose and you're not like, you're not fighting it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I know I'm, you know, I know I'm once again, like I've mentioned it, but this is what the elite athletes do. Yeah. Right. And, you know, I, I've talked to so many people in the triathlon world and I know you have too. The, you know, how do I, you know, how do I become better? Mm -hmm. You know, and I'm like, you know, it's not always working harder. Right. It's not always going for that. You know, instead of the three hour ride, three and a half, I'll go three and a half hours. Well, maybe a half hour of doing exercises, like warming up and mm -hmm. doing this, doing this stuff. You might get more out of it. Right. You know, well, and it's, it's the healthy approach. And we've talked about the holistic approach to training. And yep. you know, there are issues with getting blood flowing gradually versus starting out. And as we get older, especially that becomes a bigger issue. So uh, it is yeah. it is a healthy approach and i think that uh, part of the problem is is uh, and we've talked about this with the evidence-based world of triathlon we're not seeing research done on 48 year old men right and i th i'd love to see some research on senior level um triathletes and the efficacy of warming up mm-hmm Right, because all we have is elite athletes and college and college aged athletes on this. Well, and uh, this, I'm seeing the research. The morbid area of research is the deaths that we see during a triathlon. Yeah, and the most uh, the majority of people who do die in a triathlon die in the first 200 meter or so portion of the swim. Now, those uh, you know when they've been able to get to all top autopsy data. Uh, probably the majority of them, well, not probably, the majority of the people who have died have had some underlying heart issues. And, and this is, uh, you know, uh, cardiovascular uh, risks of, of heart disease are pretty high in the States. Yeah. So it is important that, you know, maybe some of us don't know we have uh, underlying heart uh, problems uh, and, and it only uh, comes out or is exasperated when we're under stress and that stress, and, and we talked about this in a previous uh, podcast, that stress could be mental, anxiety, could be environmental, water, it could be physical, you know, exercising. And all of a sudden that puts a, a stress on the heart and it's just not able to respond. And, and unfortunately, people have died uh, in, in the swim portion. So how does warm up, you know, and, and I think this is the swim smart uh, type of initiative that I don't know who started it, if it was USAT or Ironman, but they have advocated having a, a place for athletes to warm up uh, to, to, or at least to encourage warm up so that when they do get, you know, when that gun does go off, yeah, it's a little bit more controlled. And, it, you know, so I, and there's some value in doing the rolling start, although people have died in rolling starts and uh, mass starts, so it's not, there's not a specific pattern to, uh, to the deaths in terms of uh, the way the race starts. Yeah, but if you think about it, in the race start, are you doing that when you train? Are you going from zero to 110 seconds? Mm. No. Better right? not. <laughs> but you do it in races all the time. I see, it, I see it all of the time in races, right? We're standing around for 45 minutes in, a, in, a, in, 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 in these shoots mm -hmm. waiting to go and then the gun goes, or it's your turn in a rolling start, and it literally goes from zero to to a hundred. Yeah, and I, and I, but I think, and and I know this is where you're going. I think I think athletes need to be smarter and not do that. I think that's yeah. that's a big problem in races, uh, is that people often get the advice, oh, you got to swim hard to that first buoy. Yep. And it's like, oh no, no, you don't, because <laughs> that that can actually. Well, not unless you, maybe unless if you're prepared, right? Like you've yeah. you've done the proper warm up, and this is something that you train, yeah. right? I, and I would contend that if you are going to do a proper warm up and then do that, and you've trained to do that, like what, like I just said, how often do you do that in training? Well, maybe you should do that in training because because yeah. even if the physical stress is the same, though at least the the psychological stress won't be the same. Mm -hmm. right? And and you you if you if you read any of the stuff on like really high level triathlon coaches that are coaching age groupers. They will do this, yeah. right? It's like, okay, we're actually going to do, maybe you can even, you can warm up for 500 and then it's, it's go time. It is like, it's 200 meters all out, yep. right? 
to simulate what that is and to to basically prime your system and we'll talk about priming also when we talk about uh warming up for performance mm -hmm. uh so john i teach this in class sudden cardiac death all the time mm -hmm. so do you know the number one sign of sudden cardiac death no what's up death no <laughs> like that's the problem that it comes out of nowhere yeah like you said most of these guys they, they don't have any history right so we're talking about um like coronary artery problems and um aortic stenosis mm -hmm. and all these things that they're there but there's no signs of them until you you die mm -hmm. so yeah i think we we're in a little morbid here but i think that it's it's important um you know because one obviously triathlon we, we do triathlon to be healthy mm -hmm. we don't you know and, and and even one death is too many in triathlon yep. um so well, yeah we we're going to talk about that but it's i guess it's an important segue we're, we're getting, maybe getting off a little bit of warm-up but a personal anecdote to to relate to that is i i have blacked out during a run and uh it was with you know laura and i were running and uh stopped at a stoplight and uh crossing the street and then the you know turned the uh, walk signal turned to walk and i started running and I just, I blacked out and passed out right in the middle of the street <laughs> so yeah. or thought I was dead and yeah. I had, no, I had no warning. Well, maybe a little bit. I mean, thinking back, I was like, wow, I don't put this for a second. but then, then all of a sudden I remember waking up and my face is in the pavement and I'm like, what, what's going on? So, yeah. So yeah, no, it is, um, you know, but it is something to really, you know, especially as we get older, I mean, we really need to pay attention to our health and we got to pay attention to how we start off exercise and, uh, and, and be, you know, smart about it. Now I do in my swim, especially when I uh, am prepping for an Ironman, I'll do a um, 4,000 meter swim. And I do exactly what you talk about. I go to the pool, I do it on Friday and uh, I just walk up to the edge and that's, that's where I really start off. And I start off with the pace that I want uh, right from the beginning. Yep. And it is practicing that approach to uh, an event that uh, a lot of times it is just go. And now you got to find that pace pretty quick. And uh, But it, that pace, you can't overestimate that pace. Uh, that's the danger. And so that that's that's something that I practice over and over again, is just trying to hit that that steady pace right from the get go. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, I know, and once again, I know we were kind of going through things we went through before, but also remember, it's never your day. <laughs> you are who you train to be so you know going that extra saying oh man it's a race i'm going to swim faster no you might for the first 100 maybe 150 but you'll eventually pay the pay pay the fiddler yeah but and the other the flip side of that is you gotta let the magic happen sometimes <laughs> <laughs> john i'm trying to protect people's hearts <laughs> that's right <laughs> Oh, that's good stuff. So yeah, yeah let's do that. I'm gonna I, I'm going to uh, get some video going of, of my my pool deck warm up. Okay. And, uh, we'll we'll post that, and um, I think that would be hopefully beneficial for people. And I'll take, um, I'll take some bike tubes to the pool and do some band exercises ahead of time. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and the, the one other thing that we didn't really talk about that I'm actually I'm a quite a big advocate of is before I even do all this stuff, I, most mornings I also do a foam rolling. Oh yeah. Um, I'm in even like just 10 minutes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I try really hard to keep track of how I felt the day before. So yeah. for example, uh, on Wednesday, I did a pretty big bike ride cause you know, it was, the, it was a holiday and I was noticing, you know, my hamstring on my right was, especially when I was getting going, even though I warmed up, my hamstring was a little bit tight. So then the next morning, and make sure okay right hamstring let's spend mm -hmm. like five minutes foam rolling that because mm -hmm. i was going to run the next day yep. and and then do a dynamic warm-up and then once you get really good at the dynamic warm-up you can actually focus it right and so i did more work on the hamstring mm -hmm. and then i ran no problems at all right and i'm and then that's anecdotal this is yep. not evidence well it is evidence it's an evidence n of one mm -hmm. <laughs> It worked, it, it worked for me. And, you know, today I ran and uh, I noticed my right glute when I was, when I was just getting going, even though I warmed up, it was, it was a little tight. So, you know, before tomorrow morning, before I run tomorrow morning, I'm going to do some work on that and make sure my warm up is, you know, extra into the right glute. And, it, but, but that takes discipline too, right? Because 
you have to you have to get home and like either write it down or make a mental note that that was an area that you need to spend a little bit more time on. Mm -hmm. And I think that the knowing your body and paying attention to your body is so so important. And I and I and, and it's so easy to forget because once you get warmed up, if you're out running and you get warmed up, things don't hurt anymore, mm -hmm. right? So you forget about it. It's like, oh, that worked itself out. I'm good. Yeah. No, no, no. It, it's still there. <laughs> you just for, you, you're just not feeling it anymore. Oh, that's true. Well, you know, um, something I just thought of is, you know, as we wrap up these these uh, podcasts, each episode, we got to think about where we can point people for additional resources. Yeah. I don't know. Do you have anything off the top of your head? I know you, you pointed out that book. That book, that book is a good book. No. Um, for, yes, I, I have lots of books. No. All right. So um, there's a book by Kelly Sturette. It's called Becoming a Supple Leopard. Ah, okay. And it is, oh my gosh, it is so good. This guy, he's a physical therapist. He's mostly in the CrossFit world. Yep. But I'm telling you, if you got an area of your body that's not quite right, he's got a he's got a chapter on it. Nice. All and right. It, it's probably 600 pages yep. of of material, mm -hmm. and it's it's a it's one of my go to references because you know even as a certified athletic trainer teaching this stuff for years, I can't remember it all. Right. And. Um, you know, then the thing about that book and also this running rewired book, mm -hmm. um, there is uh, the, 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 the beginning of both those books is all about assessment of yourself. Mm -hmm. So like, can you do a squat, for example? Um, you know, can you do you know, this just basically the can you do's? Mm -hmm. And if you can't do these things, then you, you have issues somewhere. And then by, by looking at where your, your faults lie, then you can make corrections. Okay. And both those books start out like that. Um, and so if you have the time and the mental energy to do these things, they can pay off. So in, in the sports medicine world, we're really big on functional movement screening. And it's called like there's FMS screening. But there's all sorts of these different screening tools that we use. You know, you think about back in the old days. Okay, can you stand and touch your toes? Mm-hmm. Right. Well, if you can't, what does that mean? All right. Right. Well, it means you're either your back is too tight, your hamstrings are too tight or your glutes are too tight. Right. But how do we know which one of those things to work on? Mm -hmm. These books go deeper into that. Like they actually can, you know, based off of your movement patterns, um, you can actually start to identify those things. And then there's corrective exercises to, to do those things. And uh, both of them have sections on warm up which is which nice. is really good. so yeah becoming a supple leopard i think it's on amazon it's pretty expensive i think it might be 70 or 80 bucks mm. so it's not a cheap book but it's yeah. it's like for me one of the one of the the, the, the resources that i kind of go to and i use a lot even in my teaching well it's good to good to have these resources now so and and it's good to have you know people like you mm -hmm. and uh, this podcast to sort of take that information and push it back to everyone so yeah I think, I think the take home message of tonight is warm up before a workout to maximize your training benefits. Yep. And a warm up can be as simple as go easy in the beginning or much more structured. And you do need to figure out uh, which type of warm up and mix it up as well uh, yep. and get the most out of your training session. Yeah. And, and really, we, we talk about the big principles, right? Reduce injury right like that's probably the biggest principle if you think about it we've talked about this before already is you know every day you're injured and not training you're losing fitness mm -hmm. right you're injured for a month you've lost a lot of fitness yep so well, reduce injury in, improve performance yep those two things to me that, that, that's why we do what we do well and i think you know as we we've tossed around some mission statements even for why we're going to why we're doing this this podcast even and i think it really boils down to we want to help people get to the start line injury free and then maximize their performance yeah well okay. my mission is i actually enjoy talking to you on friday nights yeah 
<laughs> this is what I do for fun. <laughs> well, you know, I hope one day we can do a podcast in person. Oh, wouldn't that be crazy? Yeah, that would be that'd be a riot. So <laughs> actually do it live. Oh yeah. So the only thing I wanted to add is if yep. people are listening, and then we don't know how many people are listening. And by the way, we're on iTunes now, so that's exciting. Yeah, that's right. Um, if you guys have questions for now i think the best place is probably the las vegas triathlon clubs yep. uh facebook page mm -hmm. um, we're more than willing willing to take on questions about anything uh triathlon related um if we don't know the answer maybe we can find someone a guest you know obviously we bring guests on from time to time or we'll go read some research on it which yep. both of us enjoy doing it so uh please feel free to to ask questions we may not get to all of them and uh yeah, or we may just think, oh, that's not a very good question. <laughs> just kidding. No. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we, we, we enjoy questions as well. So, you know, and that's kind of how this whole thing happened tonight on warm up. One of my students uh, on Tuesday basically said, hey, like, I noticed these people doing this. What, what's going on? Why are they doing and it? That is a sharp student because asking a question like that, a lot of times you're afraid to ask it because you, because you think the, everyone knows the answer to it, but not until you dive into it. So yes, that's exactly. great. Okay. Well, hey, awesome. It's been fun. Yeah, that was a good night. I uh, hope everyone has a great weekend out training. Oh, what are you doing for training this weekend? More uh, working on the trailer? I am going to be doing some dynamic work, going up and down my trailer, stepping in, stepping out, going up, step, up the ladder, down the ladder. Yeah, your glutes that's are getting a good workout. Yeah. I'll, I'll do that. A great weekend. So, you know, a nice weekend outside to do it. Yep, I hope so. It'll be fun. Awesome. I'll, I'll get my training in. I, I'll I'll do my swim, bike, and run. I I just yep. I love swim, bike, and run. Yeah, love me it, too. So. All right. All right. Well, have a great weekend. This is fun. Yeah, you too. Train smart. Have fun. Okay, you too. Bye bye.